your nation, your province, your Southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News Weekend Edition. Hello, I'm Naveen Day. Thanks for joining us for a look at what's been making headlines in Alberta. Horns blared across the Trans-Canada Highway west of Calgary as a carbon tax protest slowed traffic to a crawl on both Monday and Tuesday. It was one of many held across the country over Ottawa's $15 per ton or 23% increase to the federal levy. I'm here because our country is falling apart and uh, our, our government has been running us into the ground and this needs to stop, you know. It's not just about acts of tax, it's about the freedoms and it's about our rights to uh, free speech. It's about, when people got to realize it's not just the one tax, it is, the, we are getting hit from within as well, right? So within, within the province, so, and it's, uh, but the carbon tax is big. It's a, for, for me, it's, it's, you know what, it's, you're, you're taking money from us, and for what? I, I, I have yet to see anything that's been done. I'm really impressed, and we had so many people waving and shouting and blowing their horns all the way down Highway 22. Right on, right it was good. On. I think it's only going to build. This is just the beginning. It's going to build, and there's people that are prepared to stay here as long as it takes. The trial of three men facing charges for their involvement in the 2022 Coutts border blockade got underway this week. Alex Van Herk, Gerhard Jansen and Marco Van Hugenboss have each pleaded not guilty to mischief over $5,000. Prosecutor Stephen Johnston told the jury in his opening statement Wednesday that the three defendants played a key role in blocking the highway at the Canada-U.S. border and that evidence will show the three men were leaders of the blockade and had a final say over what happened. However, the defense pursued a contrary narrative of a mishmash protest where no one had the power to call the shots. During a video played in court, Van Hugenboss and Van Herk referenced the other blockade arrests along with the seizure of several weapons and urged protesters to stop what they were doing. Jim Willits, the former mayor of Coots, was called as the first witness in the trial. He testified Coots is the only 24-hour crossing to the U.S. from Alberta and a busy route for truckers and tourists. Willett said he was concerned about the convoy affecting residents' access to grocery stores and medical clinics outside Coots, since the village doesn't have those services. The trial is scheduled to run until April the 19th. Alberta government officials say they are creating a couple of new organizations that will support the development of addiction systems and mental health care. One will be called Recovery Alberta and will be responsible for the delivery of mental health and addiction services. The province will also be establishing CORE, or the Canadian Centre of Recovery Excellence, to build recovery-oriented systems of care by researching best practices for recovery from around the world. Premier Daniel Smith says by collecting more data, they are in turn able to care for more vulnerable Albertans. We want to make sure that we've got good information, testing out, looking at what the outcomes are so that we're able to do more of what works and do less of what doesn't work. So I think we've got a lot of data now and we just want to make sure that we're, we're making the, the, the best decisions to continue to, to support recovery. The group Friends of Medicare were not pleased with Tuesday's announcement by the Premier. In a statement released, officials said Alberta saw the highest ever number of drug poisoning deaths last year. They said, instead of addressing this crisis, we saw the Premier use cherry-picked data in an attempt to justify their model, which continues to contribute to a staggering death toll. The province also announced that it is increasing funding for family resource networks by $6.6 .6 million over the next couple of years. Officials say this will help with access to free workshops for young parents, offer in-home supports, along with provide mentorship and life skills programming for children and youth. Families facing big challenges can get help early, reducing the number of children who come into government care, and families who require child intervention services. When we designed this program, we were thinking of the young expectant mother in northern rural Alberta who feels isolated from her peers and wants guidance and a helping hand to, t to help her take on the huge responsibilities she has in front of her. And the parents in Okotoks who may live far away from family and are looking for a way to meet and find camaraderie and support from other young parents, as well as Indigenous families right here in Edmonton 
are searching for a place like Bantero where they can connect to their culture and community. The province says in 2022 to 2023, networks served more than 48,600 children and youth along with 32,000 caregivers here in Alberta. After the break, we hear from Alberta's Affordability and Utilities Minister about what the province is doing to keep living costs under control. In the wake of the recent carbon tax hike and the reinstatement of the provincial fuel tax, affordability is at the forefront of many Albertans' minds. BCN's Hal Roberts sat down with the province's Affordability and Utilities Minister Nathan Newdorf to discuss affordability and other issues that are impacting Albertans. Now, Premier Daniel Smith recently posted on her Facebook page that Alberta may double its oil and gas production while being carbon neutral by the year 2050. That was the message she delivered to investors in Houston recently, Nathan. Now, I thought Alberta was going to focus more on investing in the Alberta Heritage Savings Trust Fund and maybe less in the energy sector basket. Absolutely, we are. We are making sure that we uh, put money away for that Heritage Savings Trust Fund for, for generations. So we have truly a sovereign wealth fund. Our projections are for the actions that we've taken just by reinvesting the interest. We could see that fund over $200 billion of value by 2050. Now, we do want to see our economies continue to grow. Uh, that includes in the oil and gas sector, but also for hydrogen, blue hydrogen, green hydrogen, uh, different products out of that. Uh, as we diversify our economy there, that has a knock-on effect to our, our rail and trucking industries. Uh, we are a, a carbon hub uh, here in, in Alberta. We, we look forward to further investments there. So we want to see our economy continue to grow, grow in diversity, grow in the uh, additional add-on values. And we think that we can do both for Albertans' benefit uh, in the years ahead. What do you say to those people who believe we're not doing enough to support our renewable energy sector, the green energy sector, including more wind and solar farm initiatives? Well, uh, the facts would say something different. In fact, in 2023, Alberta led all provinces in Canada with the largest amount of growth, uh, somewhere between 75 and 92 percent of all renewable investment and development happened within the province of Alberta. So we are we are leading the country in growth. We are second only to Ontario in overall renewable development. And while we've set some new parameters and uh, uh, responsibilities for that industry in Alberta, we, we continue to expect that growth to continue. Now, you recently participated in a ministerial forum as part of the Rural Municipalities of Alberta. What were some of the bigger concerns that were raised and how is the province addressing them? Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of questions about where we're going with affordable housing, and I'm very proud to be on stage with Minister Jason Nixon, who is leading that. Alberta is seeing more housing starts uh, this coming year than ever before in history. And as we increase that supply, we expect that to continue to put downward pressure onto those rental uh, costs and mortgage costs. And that's the way that we can truly uh, structurally address this issue. And we're really happy with our industry stepping up and helping us deliver on those new housing uh, options for consumers. You know, many Albertans are still scratching their heads as to why the province is moving forward with a police agency when we already have the RCMP. Now, it's not a provincial police force that was discussed in the past year. Now, folks with the AUPE that we chatted with, the union representing sheriffs, say they were really caught off guard by the government announcement. Your thoughts? Well, I think that uh, they shouldn't have been surprised. We've had a lot of requests for additional sheriff support in Calgary and Edmonton, and yes, even in Lethbridge. And this is a response to that to make sure that that body is governed in an independent way, just like our other police forces. So it's not a provincial police force. It is a strengthening of our, uh, our um, transparency and uh, autonomy within the governance structure for policing. And we look for those supports to help jurisdiction, jurisdictions like Lethbridge, Calgary, Edmonton, and others, where they need that help because of uh, crime in their downtown core or other issues. And we're working to help solve those problems. 
A number of court cases are being launched by those who say they were hurt during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdowns. Many say they lost their jobs and even their businesses. They filed class action lawsuits, not just against the federal government, but also against the province, the Alberta government. Now, Nathan, you were a business owner yourself, owner of a construction company. Let's talk about how maybe you can sympathize with those who were hurt during the lockdowns. Is there any way to ensure that Albertans will never be hurt like this ever again? Well, I can't comment on anything specific before the courts, obviously. Uh, we know that it was a challenging time for, for every jurisdiction around the world and governments approached in different ways. Uh, we are interested to hear the outcome of some of those things, but uh, until that's concluded, I can't really comment too much further other than understanding the challenges that we all faced during that time. Alberta Utilities and Affordability Minister Nathan Newdorf, appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us today from Lethbridge. Uh, great to be here, Hal. Thank you again for the interview. Well, it's the first weekend of April, which means it's less than one month before our tax filings are due. After the break, we hear from a financial expert to talk taxes. You know, it seems like the weather just can't seem to make up its mind what season we're in. You know, just days ago, we were enjoying spring weather, and then overnight, we flipped back into winter mode. But one season we are definitely in now is tax season. Kent Prestige has decades of experience preparing taxes. He sat down with BCN's Jeanette Roche with some advice on how to prepare your taxes and hopefully save some money. Take a look. Well, uh, April 30th for most people. Uh, if you have a business, it's uh, June 15th. But for most people, it's April 30th. And uh, the penalties, uh, you want to file on time. Uh, if you're late filing, it's a 5% penalty on the amount of tax that you still owe. And also, if you're late filing for a whole month, each additional month, they add another 1% to it. And on top of that, uh, the compound interest uh, daily at 10% for this year. So you want to file on time, especially if you owe taxes. Yeah, uh, yeah I was just going to say, and those fines are for if you are owing, if you're getting money back, uh, if there's not a penalty, there, right? There's no fine if you're getting money back, uh, except for, you know, you'd rather have your money in your hands right now, I would yeah. assume. The sooner yeah. the better, right? So, Kent, ever since the COVID pandemic, there have been a lot more people working from home. And up until now, the CRA had a simplified method simplified method of yeah. claiming home office expenses, but things have changed this year. So can maybe you explain a little bit of, about what these changes are? Sure. So the uh, simplified method was uh, if you were working at home during the, the pandemic, uh, you were allowed to claim $2 a day up to a maximum of $500 um, uh, for home expenses while you were uh, working from home. Uh, this year, they did away with that. They went back to basically the old way that you would normally have had to have claimed those expenses. Uh, you'd have to have the company that you work for sign a 20, uh, 2200 a form, a T2200. And that form is, um, it allows you to claim expenses for working from home. Then now you have to keep track of all of your expenses. So Let's say you set aside an office and it's 10% of your home, which is quite typical. Most people would take a bedroom and set it up as an office. And that's usually about 10% of your home. So you can claim 10% of your utilities, 10% of your interest, 10% of fire insurance and any expenses that have to do with your home. You can also claim uh, a cell phone and other expenses like that. But again, now you have to have records to prove all of these expenses, whereas last year it was just uh, $2 a day, $500, no matter what uh, you claimed as expenses. Right, exactly. Okay, now I understand that there is an opportunity for first time home buyers with the first home savings account to save for a, a down payment. Yeah, actually, this is a pretty good deal. Uh, it's very similar to an RRSP. Uh, you can put up to eight thousand dollars a year into this home, this first homes uh, program, and up to a maximum of forty thousand dollars. 
uh, if you take that money, well, so it's sheltered from tax, so you don't pay tax on it while it's in there. When you take it out, if you buy a house with it, you don't have to pay tax on that money at all, which is a really good deal, $40,000, uh, you know, with no tax on it at all. So that's a pretty good deal uh, for a first-time homeowner, yeah. And it's such a great way to save as well. Exactly. Wonderful. You're saving on the tax as well as uh, saving for a house. Exactly. A, kind of a win-win there, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So are there, are there potential tax implications when you buy or sell a home? Speaking of home buying. Yeah, there's, there's some new ones that have just come out here. Like uh, if you uh, live in your house and you sell your house, there's no tax on that, at least currently. The liberals may change that. But at this point, there's no tax when you sell your the house that you live in. But they're bringing in new rules against anti-flipping, uh, where people will buy a house, they'll renovate it, uh, and then they'll sell it. Now, you used to be able to claim the income that you would make on that as a capital gain. Well, capital gains tax treatment is better than regular income tax treatment. Uh, now there's if you if you own a house for less than a year, it's going to be treated as income, which is taxed at a higher rate. Uh, so they're trying to, uh, you know, discourage people from buying a house and flipping it, although it's still a great way to make money. It's just not quite as good as it used to be. It was a little over two years ago that our nation's capital was the epicenter of what sparked protests around the world. I'm talking about the Freedom Convoy. After the break, we hear from one eyewitness that shared a video during the police operation that shocked us all. It was a scream that was heard around the world. During the 2022 Freedom Convoy in Ottawa, a grandmother was seriously injured when she was trampled by police horses. One of the bystanders who happened to be filming at the time posted the footage to social media where it went viral. Jeremiah Jost shares details of the horrific event with BCN's Michael Clausen. I think everyone watching uh, would remember the horrific video that went viral of the elderly grandmother. Hmm. She had a walker. She was up in that far corner. I had been in that corner and mm -hmm. she got trampled by an RCMP horse. And I understand yeah. that uh, shortly before this occurred, your wife had been holding that actual lady's arm, uh, and yeah. you were the one who was filming the event, and you posted it to social media. Mm -hmm. Can you share from your vantage point what you saw happen? And maybe uh, fill us in on if you thought that that force was warranted? Was this lady actually posing a threat to the police? You know, that, that whole morning, um, there were veterans walking up and down the line saying, two feet, two feet between you and the policeman. Stay calm. Don't raise your voices. Don't get excited. And right up until the, even when the grandmother was trampled, there was people telling me, who's a pretty calm, reasonable guy, you remember, we need to stay calm. But this, this lady had walked up beside my wife. She had a walker with a little uh, car squeegee and a, a white shirt hanging down, which is a sign of, you know, we come in peace. Um, and she was just heartfeltly speaking to these um, people in rag gear. You know, I'm here. She said, I'm here for my grandkids. Um, we're a peaceful protest. We have the right to be here. Uh, we have the right to peaceful assembly. And right after she's saying this, and I'm filming it, and I just felt like I was supposed to drop the camera down and show that she's this peaceful grandmother holding a walker. And then these horsemen come running through. And this was the second time that they had run the, ho the horses. They only ran the horses twice. I, um, you know, I've been around ranchers and farmers who know how to ride. And I tell you, these RCMP people did not know what they were doing. They were bouncing around these horses like they were just introduced to them yesterday. And these were huge horses. Um, and I remember just in the blink of an eye, these horses coming and my wife and I backed up just like a foot or two. And to my horror, this lady who's in a walker, she's not this athlete who can jump back. She just gets trampled. 
Um, a guy, a gentleman who tried to get in front of the horses and protect her, he was also brutally trampled. And um, I mean, the, the horrific part was she could have been dead right there. And all of us were watching. We had no clue if she was even alive. So I remember me and my wife just sobbing after for a while. To this day, I, I can't even watch that video. I mean, they would run the horses to gain about 50 feet of progress. And for 50 feet, you're, it's just not worth killing innocent citizens. I mean, this lady was a, was a lady. Uh, she was a, an elder at her Mohawk reserve. Just, just beautiful, peaceful lady. Yeah. And I will say from my recollection of the event, I had been, and I don't know if your video shows the red pickup truck. I'd been standing on that tailgate for quite a while live streaming. Mm. And I had this really strong sense that I needed to leave and go back up to our hotel, the Westin. Mm. And we had that camera that was shooting down on that intersection. And oh, yeah. no sooner had I arrived, we had the windows open. I arrived inside the room and Naveen, my coworker, was recording. No sooner had I walked up to the window and I saw those horses, and I can still to this day hear the screams mm. from that lady that went up yeah. 26 floors. Let's move on from that. I want to ask you about the federal judge, Richard Mosley. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So he had started that, the, he had stated rather that the charter rights were indeed violated. What mm -hmm. did you observe? What were some of the more serious violations of our rights that you saw? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and even though we did kind of get an overall win in that court case, there were many charter of rights that weren't even touched. Um, and, and us four um, people who did sue um, individually, there was two veterans, there was one ex-police officer, and then myself. And uh, two of us had, uh, two of them had their bank accounts frozen, myself and another did not. And um, if we, what would have been awesome is if we had had somebody who was um, beaten, because there was so many people who were pulled behind the lines. Coming up, stories from around Southern Alberta. A man bitten by a dog here in southwestern Alberta ended up helping to save another man's life. Police in Tabor say they received a complaint last Thursday morning about a man who was bitten by a dog near the Tabor Sugar Factory property. When officers arrived, they found a large Akita dog laying on a berm. As they got closer, they heard a 61-year-old man who was crying for help. It turns out the man got stuck in a muddy ditch and had been there for two days. Police say... His dog, aptly named Hero, stayed by his side, helping to keep him warm and even fended off coyotes. Police were able to rescue the man and he was treated in hospital with undisclosed injuries. Police say the other dog walker, who had been bitten and received medical attention, told police under the circumstances he was understanding of the situation and was grateful that the owner of the Akita was rescued. When it comes to spring seeding, a number of farmers here in southwestern Alberta have been dealing with some pretty wet conditions. David Bishop is the director of Alberta Grains and Farms out by Barron's. He says even though they have received some moisture, much more is needed, especially for our reservoirs. We're wet right now, which is good. So um, it's likely going to be normal seeding for us first part of May. We have another major supposedly snow event, rain event coming here at the end of this week, which would be great. Hopefully we get snow in the mountains, get the snowpack built up so we can get our reservoirs filled a little better. So we can do some irrigating. You can water your lawn to keep it green. Things like that need to happen and we need more snow in the mountains for that. We're still not out of the woods as far as a drought condition goes, but right now you're looking out in the fields, there's water laying everywhere. It's wet, it's muddy. So that's something we haven't had for a few years. So it's looking good to start. And then after that, we'll see what happens. The latest public art installation here in Lethbridge does not sit in one spot, but there's only one place you can see it. What is it and where is it? The answers are in this next story. A new public art installation was unveiled Thursday morning at the Logan Boulay Arena. It is called Interwoven Legacies and it celebrates the impact of the organ donation of the arena's namesake following the April 2018 Humboldt bus crash. 
Today's event serves as a kickoff to Green Shirt Day, an annual drive for organ donation registration so that others facing losses similar to the Boulay family know that their loved ones will continue on helping others even after death. What was unveiled was two art installations, a mural of pictures covering the exterior windows and a vinyl wrap on the arena's Zamboni. Both of these installations were designed by Lethbridge artist Carla Mather Cox. She says creating the unique design was a tedious task. A black and white photo and then a colored photo was then cut into strips, reorganized, taped, and recut and sorted and taped again. So each photo resulted in a bunch of little tiny tiles that I thought represented the theme of the ripple effect. Um, so it, there was a little bit of process in doing them, for sure. Originally envisioned for the exterior of the building was something much larger. However, it would have involved the removal of the exterior stonework. In the fall of 22, the Public Arts Committee and the City called the Lethbridge Historical Society and said that they were hoping to put public art on the building and they wished to speak to us about it. Because one of their first questions was whether or not the stonework on the outside of the building was original to the building and did we mind if they took it off. Sent a letter around to some of our members, particularly those that were concerned with built heritage, and immediately got back the response of, no, 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 no. <laughs> please don't take the stonework off. Yes, it is original, and yes, it is part of the design that Norm Fuchs did when he designed this building. Since the stonework was deemed to be a character-defining element of the building, it was not removed. As for the Boulay family, they are happy with how the new artwork turned out. Logan's father, Toby Boulay, says the family wanted something that people could enjoy looking at over and over. We wanted a piece of art the committee that you just don't see once you go, oh, that's nice, and keep walking. It's like, what to do? I, every time I go by the front on the road, the, the windows, or the Zamboni goes by, they see something different, differently. And the parents feel art is a proper way to honor their son. Logan actually, when he was in high school, he took art classes because he contemplated being an architect, and so he needed to take art. And I think he would really enjoy this because he loved color and he loved to create with different mediums. And this would be something that he would be really proud of because it's not just a piece of art, it has so much, it tells a story. The unveiling comes ahead of Green Shirt Day, which is April the 7th. For Bridge City News, I'm Naveen Day. The federal government is open to making changes to the Emergencies Act. After the break, Hal Roberts chats with Lethbridge MP Rachel Thomas to hear her thoughts.